Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Nano Emulsion Formulation and Characterization for Life Science and Industrial Markets, presented by Dr. John Costello, the Technical Sales Specialist at Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. I am Tracy S. Martin of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. For more information on our sponsor, please visit Beckman.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. John Costello. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. John Costello, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Tracy. I appreciate it. Um, as she mentioned, I'm going to uh, have a talk today regarding our nano emulsion formulation characterization activities. Uh, first, I'd like to just thank my, my colleagues, uh, Derek and Edgar, for their support in putting this together. Uh, in particular, I'd like to emphasize Edgar's contribution. He's a, our application lab specialist in uh, our applications lab down in Miami, Florida. Uh, and he's done a, a, a lot of the technical uh, testing of our of, uh, the data that we'll be presenting. So just a quick uh, outline of our talk today, um, a brief review of some of the market applications of emulsions, uh, get into some of the different uh, types of emulsions and terms. Um, from there, segue to uh, one of some of the key quality control aspects of emulsions, uh, particularly the particle size analysis. I'll then go into a couple of case studies uh, focused on the nano emulsions, again, uh, particularly flavored oil emulsions or soda concentrates, as well as uh, the, some CBD oil nano emulsions. Uh, we'll finish up with a brief summary uh, and then get into some questions and answers. So emulsions uh, have a variety of different uh, uh, characteristics. But basically, the, uh, the one of the key things is the there's two or several mixtures that are not uh, miscible. They're not uh, soluble in one another. They don't uh, they don't like to mix well, such as oil and water. And so one of the things that uh, you have is that a majority of the emulsion is called the continuous phase. Uh, the minority of emulsion is the dispersed phase. So uh, oil and water is a good ex working example that uh, is typically used, either oil and water or water in oil, uh, depending on the, the percentage differences. Uh, but you'll have droplet formation uh, on those, and it's a matter of uh, how long does that stay, uh, how, how long can these droplets be uh, in that present state uh, one of the ways to go and help that is through some emulsification um, enhancers called emulsifiers. But in general, uh, there's a variety of different uh, markets that uh, uh, utilize this capability, both in uh, pharmaceutical, uh, drug delivery, uh, of course, food and beverage, uh, but industrial applications of metalworking and oil refining, building materials, paints, inks, et cetera. Uh, just a couple of examples to sort of start working through. Uh, milk of magnesia, 
is is a longstanding uh, emulsion uh, put together for magnesium hydroxide uh, in water solution from all the way back from the 1700s. Uh, as well, Bosch and Loam has a uh, this um, eye drop lubricant uh, emollient. It is a uh, water in oil droplet. Um, it al actually allows you to dropper the oil with a little bit of water in there to help prevent uh, uh, dry eye. As well, you can get into the lotions, et cetera, uh, for, for dry skin, et cetera. Industrial-wise, um, asphalt is an emulsion technology, a fairly large uh, size, but um, the particle size is is critical there because it's going to affect um, various properties such as drying time, uh, the consistency of the product, as well as strength. And what's shown on the right-hand side uh, below is several different formulations that have uh, what the cohesion strength is of the asphalt as a function of particle size. Um, basic takeaway on that, the smaller the particle size, the higher the, the cohesive strength of the asphalt. So there's a, a key attribute uh, related to size and which will become part of the scene here, uh, but that how it affects some of the properties. Um, and Axo Nobel uh, and a variety of other industrial Mark accounts have a lot of uh, literature associated with this stuff, which can be obtained from their uh, websites. Uh, pigments and dyes, paints, uh, a variety. Uh, they're all emulsions, um, fairly large size, because uh, in this particular case, you still will wind up having to stir things up, but for the most part, we want to try to um, keep them relatively stable in there without too much mixing, but certainly when being applied um, onto a paper or painting of a house, uh, you want to have that fairly consistent uh, delivery. And so we get that by creating these emulsions uh, with some emulsification to get to a certain particle size, which will uh, perhaps have some additives as well that uh, help with the uh, various uh, optical properties of these. Uh, as well, you can get into the stability after washing uh, based on certain additives that go into it. So uh, it's an assemblage of all these particles that come together, which collectively can be balled up and uh, stabilized into an emulsion uh, that will impart uh, useful properties. A very unique one is uh, the lubricants that uh, can be on the edge of that uh, razor that uh, many of us will use day to day. Uh, it's an, uh, a nano emulsion that will, um, based on the shear action uh, from moving it across your leg, will deposit some of the uh, oil, which will help with lubricating the surface and um, giving you a nice, uh, nice shave. As well, there's a, a number of specialty chem chemical manufacturers uh, that have uh, lots of emulsion formulations uh, as well as emulsifiers uh, that they offer. Uh, in part, I, I showed the, this particular slide from Dow uh, just to sort of highlight some of the markets that uh, on the left-hand side. There are uh, many, many uses for various emulsions that uh, they offer to the uh, uh, the customer, the market uh, capabilities. So let's get into a little bit of uh, emulsion basics. Um, basically, uh, we come down to um, the ability to control the hydrophobic, hydrophilic nature of these uh, mixtures of liquid. Uh, in in the case of oil and water, again, uh, we're Oil is hydrophobic. It doesn't like to mix with the water, in part because of the nonpolar nature of the molecular structure. There's large carbon chains that uh, exist, uh, and they like to hang out with one another. They don't like uh, to mix with the water. Conversely, the 
water uh, and vinegar. Uh, vinegar is a hydrophilic. It loves to mix with water. Um, and because of the polar nature of, of the carbonyl groups, uh, hydroxide ions, um, and so that's what colors the water droplets, the uh, oil or the, the, um, the vinegar inside of the oil droplets. Now, the, the oil water mixture can be mixed up further, but without much help, it will start to segregate out. And so it's very hard to keep that uh, emulsified uh, unless one starts to use the emulsifiers. Uh, emulsification can be enhanced uh, by using these amphiphilic uh, components, uh, which are basically, um, they have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts and help to mediate the charges uh, between the polar and nonpolar um, uh, molecules, helping to emulsify. Uh, given that the emulsification in, imparts a lot of useful physical properties, there's lots of emulsifiers out there for different uh, uh, material systems, and as well, uh, they can be very proprietary. Uh, the demand can be very high, and obviously. Some of these can cost quite a bit of money. As mentioned before, uh, emulsion size is, is a very uh, critical um, factor in imparting some of the emulsion properties. Um, what's shown here is some sizing information for uh, three different uh, processes that were run uh, from, from a customer site. Uh, and looking at uh, having certain pass-fail criteria. Um, they, process B obviously hit all the right um, sizing requirements, which would uh, allow it to be uh, moved forward. Uh, process A obviously was over-milled and uh, was going to have uh, a lot smaller particles, overall particle size, uh, which would cause a fail uh, for whatever reason, uh, for that particular material system. Uh, likewise, process C was not milled enough. And so addressing the particle size distributions uh, is what one of the critical factors are for uh, monitoring uh, these emulsions. Um, very useful paper uh, by some of the folks in, um, in uh, MIT, but uh, Gupta et al. Um, I've taken a table from them uh, because it gives some useful talking terms as far as uh, the various emulsion nomenclature. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, macro emulsions, which are similar to what were shown in some of those lotions and obviously mayonnaise and other uh, these larger format um, emulsions. Um, anywhere from 1 to 100 microns, or you can even go much larger than that. Um, basically, they're, they're going to be spherical in nature, um, but uh, they're not very stable. They like to start separating out, as we mentioned earlier. Um, various methods of preparation you can emulsify by applying, applying high and low energy to them. But again, they're not going to be very stable. They'll probably start to um, kinetically start to um, uh, cause creaming, et cetera. And their polydispersity, that's the breadth of the size distribution that you may find in those. Uh, you can see up there with the picture there that there's a variety of different particle sizes. Conversely, on the right-hand side, the microemulsions, um, these are thermodynamically stable uh, implementations of emulsion. Uh, you can see a phase diagram shown uh, on there where there are, cert there are certain areas of formulation and temperature, et cetera, where you have uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, and then there are also regions of um, non-equilibrium, which would cause the breakdown of uh, the emulsion. Um, these are very, they form on their own. They can get uh, anywhere from 
10 to 100 nanometers uh, and fairly easy to form when mixed in the right proportions and at the right temperatures, et cetera. The thermodynamic stability is what uh, helps with that. However, if you move out of that stability zone, you will now start to have the breakdown of the, uh, the emulsions. Uh, a mixture uh, be in between these two is with the, the nano emulsion, um, anywhere from 20 to 500 nanometer approximately. Um, again, they're going to be spherical. Uh, we use a lot of high and low energy methods to, particularly high energy, to really get to smaller and smaller uh, values of size. Uh, this imparts, while thermodynamically unstable, they impart a kinetic stability, meaning that uh, depending on the size, uh, these will remain stable for uh, periods of time that are going to be engineered to accomplish what their mission is um, in, in their application. So. There's a variety of uh, particle sizing techniques out there in the industry. Uh, I've shown a chart here that has a, a variety of techniques uh, on the lower end, uh, going from a size of uh, angstrom level all the way up through to the millimeter level. Um, the yellow band uh, displayed is what is used with the nano emulsion size range, anywhere from the 10 nanometer up to about 500 nanometer or so. Um, I highlight two particular sizing techniques that are very useful in emulsion technology, uh, laser diffraction as well as dynamic light scattering, um, in part because of the ability to size in that range, uh, do it with fairly high accuracy and precision, and have a fairly good ease of use. Um, there are other techniques uh, such as SEM and TEM, um, various other of these that are in that size range that can be orthogonal testing, but also have some pros and cons that uh, would show the utility of it or cause a lot more, you know, the ease of use may not be as, uh, as nice. So let's talk a little bit about uh, dynamic light scattering. Uh, particles suspended in a solution will move randomly under Brownian motion, dependent on the particle size, the temperature, and the viscosity of the solution in which they are. The light fluctuation, um, as, as particles move around and are hit by the, the laser beam, def will deflect light onto the photo detector. Uh, comparing to a reference beam, uh, one can get the light intensity fluctuation as a function of time in microseconds. Um, this can be used to evaluate the decay rate um, of, of the signal um, during the fluctuation of, of the light as it's being monitored. The autocorrelation analysis allows you to go and fit the, that decay term to a particular size of uh, diffusional model based on the Stein, Stokes Einstein relationship. From this, uh, the hydrodynamic radius solution can be calculated, displayed over on the right hand side. The autocorrelation function is probably the, the most critical measurement um, that you want to make for dynamic light scattering to get useful and meaningful interpreted interpretations of the size. Um, I, I emphasize this a lot with a lot of the, the customers that we deal with for setting proper expectations about DLS. Um, if you look at the signal up on the top left, you've got the solvent signal, uh, which is basically highly filtered, the lack of any particles there. And you're, you're basically going to be seeing this, the, the, the noise floor of the detector system with the laser on. Fairly quick drop-off um, and, 
and then it just goes to a baseline of 1.0. So the right-hand side on top is a small particle, a unimodal distribution, and what you have there is the autocorrelation function is a nice decay term that goes down to the 1.0 baseline at you know, approximately 100 microseconds. Conversely, a large particle on the lower left um, has a similar kind of decay curve, but at a much higher um, time constant. Uh, the microseconds is more on the order of about a, uh, a, uh, a millisecond. And that's what dictates the size. The, the, the smaller particles travel much faster in the solution uh, than the larger particles, and therefore have a, a faster time uh, order correlation curve, faster time constant. Now, if you mix these two, you can actually see how it broadens out uh, the overlay of both curves. And so you can fit unimodal distributions to the multimodal population there and get a multimodal population. Um, on the next slide, I get into looking at that. This is a, a very useful uh, process to go through for understanding what kind of information you can receive from DLF. We use polystyrene latex particle standards, reference material. Uh, on the top left, uh, I have four different um, curves, uh, measurements of 100, 200, uh, 300 and 500 nanometer beads. And you can see the delay curves uh, move very consistently in, into higher uh, microsecond delay uh, based on their size. Uh, down below, on the, on below that, on the lower left, are the three or four uh, distribution curves overlaid on one another. And again, these are the unimodal populations and so they have uh, a very sharp peak, um, um, modal, modal value, and they have a fairly tight um, distribution of particles. The polydispersity index is a factor that is used to the breadth of the distribution. Now, if you mix several of these particles together, um, then you have a little bit more difficulty uh, measuring. Uh, you can, uh, what's shown on the right-hand side uh, is the overlay of the four unimodal populations, but the green curve is uh, triplicate runs of a trimodal solution of 100, 300, and 500 nanometer beads. The solution for that gives you that broad, broader distribution, which is the sum of all three of those uh, particle populations. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that you can do baseline resolution only with diameters that are greater than approximately 3x. Uh, the DLS will have a hard time resolving tighter populations. And so the, what happens is you wind up having to go with uh, using either that broad distribution result or try to go with some other technique for resolving these uh, populations if they're tighter. Um, a useful, one of the, one of the key uh, value adds of dynamic light scattering is the ability to measure the zeta potential or the electrophoretic mobility. With nanoparticle populations or submicron and nanoparticles, um, electrostatics become that much more important. Uh, the ability to diffuse or to eliminate van der Waal forces that will aggregate these small particle populations is critical. So molecules or the small particles can be stabilized both with steric as well as electrostatic methods. Steric methods are you coat the particles with uh, a polymer, a non a polar uh, a nonpolar uh, substance, which basically shields the particles from 
interacting with one another. Uh, electrostatic methods are similar to like the emulsification where you can create a charge around the surface of that which will create a, a repulsive force and keep the primary particles from attracting to one another. Uh, this is what's called the zeta potential. Zeta potential refers to the, it, it roughly equates to the charges that are associated with the particle, uh, both around the particle, but in the solution itself. So the zeta potential is always going to be environmentally constrained to the solution that is, the particles are in. So uh, the technique basically uses an electric field, it, which oscillates back and forth, and you're going to monitor now the mobility of the particles under the influence of the electric field. And they're directly related to the charge of the particles. The higher the charge, the more movement back and forth you'll be, you'll be seeing. Um, through the various analyses, one can determine the zeta potential. And a typical rule of thumb for good colloidal stability uh, due to the zeta potential is typically plus or minus 30 millivolts. If you have that kind of voltage uh, associated with individual particles, you can be assured, or higher, you can be assured that you will have good uh, primary particle uh, populations and not have to worry about uh, aggregates, et cetera. Uh, one of the aspects of the zeta potential, which can be used is, uh, in, in some of these applications, is things like uh, uh, deflocculation or flocculation, uh, both of, for clays as well, ceramics, as well as, uh, you know, some uh, correcting for effluent waters. But uh, there you're manipulating the zeta potential going through the isoelectric point, which is going to be where you're reducing the, 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 uh, your, your zeta potential and, and causing attraction, which will lead to aggregation and subsequent precipitation of large particles. So you can work both sides of the zeta potential equation that way. So let's get into laser diffraction uh, particle size analysis as well. This is a higher resolution sizing technique, uh, but has also a very wide dynamic range. Um, it's, based, it's based on using a light source, which is uh, shined through a flow cell that has particles purposely dropped in front of it, whether it be in liquid or in a dry powder. And the light it gets diffracted. It gets uh, bent in angular fashion, uh, which can be picked up by the, by the photo detectors. And so there's an angular specificity associated with the light that can be directly related to particle size. On the right-hand side, you can see a, a series of curves which relate to the diffraction patterns for spherical particles of varying sizes from 20 microns all the way down to uh, 10 or 100 nanometers. And you can see the first minimum, that there's min and max uh, uh, interference that causes the diffraction rings for spherical particles. And so by looking at that first minimum, at the angle at which it was uh, a minimum, will give you uh, what the size is. And so what one can do with this is to look at the flux intensity patterns that are generated uh, with a, over a broad range of uh, material or broad, broad range of particle sizes and go and extract out what the size distribution is, both number as well as volume percentages. And you can do this very accurately. Um, in order to move down to the extremely low particle sizes, we have used a PID detection system, which I'll discuss in, in a moment on the next slide. But this allows you to go from the 400 to from the 400 nanometer range all the way down to 10 nanometers, and this is used primarily for the nano emulsions. That's why I'm bringing it up. So we have our LS13320. Just a brief, uh, limited commercial break. Uh, uh, our 
LS13320 XR is our latest version of our laser diffraction offering. Uh, the XR stands for the extended range. Um, again, we have this wide dynamic size range that we can measure particles uh, across uh, a range of 10 nanometers all the way to 3,500 microns, 3.5 millimeters. Uh, we have both wet and dry uh, modules that can be used. Um, we can go, and without any kind of model, we can have the algorithm go and solve for the distribution based on the light uh, parameters that it, it has measured. Uh, with the main beam, uh, we have a 780 nanometer laser with 126 space detectors to give you that angular specificity. Um, and uh, that gives us this high resolution of, and, and allows us to really discern these very small populations that exist, uh, particularly in that, in that particular size range, the 400 nanometer to um, 3,500 microns. Again, PID is polarization intensity differential scattering. Uh, basically, it looking at the horizontal and vertical components of three different wavelengths of light at six different uh, side scatter angles. And this gives us a lot of information about small particles, anywhere from two microns down to that 10 nanometer, very discerning um, uh, and is used primarily in that uh, exclusively for doing the nano emulsion sizing. It uses me theory scattering, so we need to know what the uh, refractive index model is, um, but uh, it can give you very accurate uh, uh, analyses. Fully automated operations, anywhere from 15 to 60 second runtime. Uh, and uh, for pharmaceutical applications, uh, we have full compliance with GMP uh, and the ability to do IQOQ. So let's go and look at the reference particle testing here, much the same way with the uh, dynamic light scattering. We use reference particles, polystyrene, latex beads, and, and others. Um, on the top left, we have a 100 nanometer um, standard, uh, which can, you can see how very sharp that uh, distribution is. Uh, the one below that is the trimodal that we were referring to before. Uh, this particular one is uh, 80 nanometers, 200 and 500 nanometer uh, polystyrene beads mixed. Uh, you can see how we can baseline resolve uh, those peak populations. That's totally uh, it's significantly better than the, what the DLS could do as before. I actually show an overlay of the DLS result that we measured with this particular trimodal solution versus the, uh, the laser diffraction uh, shown on the right-hand side. Up above is a a trimodal solution that is up in the hundreds of micron range, uh, which again shows you the kind of resolution capabilities that you can get with the main beam. Interestingly, we can have both trimodal solutions in the same uh, popul same uh, carrier solution. And if you were to measure that, um, basically what you would see initially is the, that, uh, the large uh, trimodal results. Um, however, we have the ability to turn off the main beam because of the in, high in, higher intensity scattering. The, you can't really see that well. The, it does meet, it does, the, the small molecule population does not become significant. However, we can turn off the main beam and just look at the PID, and lo and behold, you would have that trimodal result. So it's an interesting utility of that uh, for looking at large versus small populations. Okay, let's get into some of our case studies. Uh, flavored oil emulsions, um, the Coca-Cola, Pepsi, you know, concentrate, uh, the secret ingredient that gets mixed with the beverages. That's what it's all about. Uh, we have displayed a big application is soft drinks. Um, uh, as well, there's a whole variety for food and beverage. Um, flavorings that are shown up on the left-hand side. All of them involve use of emulsions, emulsifiers, to keep stable for their intended use when they are then um, sent to customers that then have them mix in various uh, formats and timeframes. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. 
to get into that. Uh, flavored oil emulsions have a variety of flavonoids, emulsifiers, other ingredients to impart certain characteristics. Um, they like to, they need to have sizing uh, to impart a stability over and shelf life of the product. If not sized correctly over time, uh, it'll break down as we were mentioning before. And so, particularly in the case of the of the soda uh, market, um, concentrate plants need to go and have some stability when they create that um, emulsion because they're now shipping it to a third party bottling plant and then the and so they need to have that stability otherwise you get into a, a range of problems where they don't accept the product when it's there. And these are extremely high, large volume formats, hundreds of gallons at a time. And so uh, what they're really looking for is to impart that kinetic stability for a several week kind of period at least uh, for each of those different uh, sort of emulsions. Just from a flow, flow chart point of view, uh, you know, those circular areas are the initial formulation uh, at the syrup producer. Um, the final QC check, when it's shipped, um, they release that lot and then it's sent to the distributor, whether it be by boat or truck, et cetera, uh, the bottling plants. And so they typically will want to confirm that, that the sizing is correct before they commit it to the full bottling process. Uh, at that point, it's, it's basically done. It's up to the customer to drink it before they have it um, sitting on the shelf too long. There's several different ways to test the emulsion stability of these concentrates. Uh, the old school has been the ring test. Uh, you put some of the material, um, once it's been emulsified, hom homogenized, into a, a clear vial, put it up on the shelf, and, and watch for it to create if it forms a ring. Uh, that's where the emulsion is, is creaming and creating a ring around the top surface. That, that process, though, when done appropriately for kinetic stability, could take days, weeks, or even longer. And so they moved over the years to looking at some optical imaging to do that sizing. And um, they have lim been limited to approximately at one micron at the time. And so uh, some of these concentrate manufacturing facilities came to us to say, hey, what about your laser diffraction system? Would you be able to um, provide us uh, lower values? Because in the in the particular case with the optical uh, imaging, uh, basically they were only able to see as, uh, about half the population, and so that was very challenging to say, okay, the peak is exactly at the, where that measurement was. Laser diffraction was went in. We've we've done this with a number of of customers. Uh, and, and distributed the, the, the units worldwide um, because of the ability to go anywhere from 10 nanometers up to 2,000 microns with water-based as uh, kind of emulsion. Um, the method is very uh, reliable, uh, easy to use, has the, re the accuracy and performance capabilities, and can actually be QA, QC from one plant to the next. So here's just uh, two different examples of some flavored oil emulsion. Um, these are triplicate runs of both of those. Um, you can see where one particular one has a, a mean size of about uh, 200 nanometers, uh, whereas the other one uh, is a little bit larger in size uh, about, at about 300 nanometer. But these would be, uh, once again, they would have pass-fail criteria that are related to um, the, the modal values, or perhaps the D10, D50, D90s, which are the um, the breadth of the uh, of the emulsion sizes. Uh, but it's all dependent on what the customer feels is the the appropriate uh, sizing for that. With the legalization of cannabis products uh, over the last couple of years, we've been approached by a number of customers that were interested in analyzing their uh, various emulsions. Um, so 
one of the things we did was we went and picked up some CBD oils at a local uh, store and wanted to just do some testing of that as is, as well as looking at some um, higher energy emulsification using uh, the, the sonicator assembly that I have shown pictorial on the right-hand side. Um, this was capable of generating 200 watts of power. Uh, it's a fairly large probe. Um, what you can see is a, a beaker that is uh, it's inserted into that was used as a coolant reservoir. Uh, the scintillation vials are actually shown in the front of that, uh, that the picture of the assembly in various states. Uh, you can see as is we received the material. It was fairly turbid, fairly large particle size. I'll get into that in a minute. But with the emulsification um, due to the high-power son high sonication treatment um, and the use of some of the emulsifiers um, or surfactants, we were able to uh, bring the particle size significantly down to the point where it was translucent. Uh, you can literally uh, not see the optical scattering of the, of the submicron components. And so we went and evaluated both laser diffraction as well as dynamic light scattering with these samples. Um, CBD oil number one, I'm, I, I again have three different sample results, um, and I'm going to go through each of them, um, basically pointing out the same uh, the results that we have. Uh, in this particular case, the CBD oil I show the on the top left hand side is the as is size distribution. Uh, it was a, um, a micron sized kind of emulsion, just a mixture. It wasn't expected to be a nano emulsion per se. Um, and the, the three different ones that I selected had various uh, flavonoids and other mixtures. Uh, I didn't have any clue as to what the size was going to be. I just wanted to start with some of these and 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 begin with what the as is state was and then from there go and emulsify and see what the results are uh, below that curve the top curve on the lower left is the final uh, value as measured with the laser diffraction system um, i believe that it was on the order of uh, 60 nanometer uh, size modal value um, on the top right, you can see the autocorrelation function curve uh, for that, that same sample. We literally just extracted some of the uh, emulsion uh, solution from the laser diffraction system and put it into our DLS system. And you can see the sizing results. And uh, we, below that, what we've done is actually overlaid um, the DLS curve with the LS results. Uh, interestingly, you can see there's fairly good correlation with the modal values, um, but you can see a significantly sharper uh, sizing result with the laser diffraction, which uh, is implied by the higher resolution capabilities that uh, laser diffraction has. Okay, so. CBD oil number two, um, very similar. We did not, uh, I did not put the sizing result uh, uh, of the as-is material, but again, uh, each, in each case, they were approximately in that tens of micron kind of range. Um, but we were able to bring them down uh, to the nano emulsion size uh, with the application of powder, uh, power of, from the asonicator. In this particular case, we see about 130 uh, nanometer size a little bit broader solution um, uh, on the tail end, um, but again, fairly good uh, autocorrelation function, the sizing result with DLS. And once again, uh, fairly good agreement between the, the, uh, uh, the DLS and the LS result. Uh, the, the, the slight disagreement in the modal value is probably a result of that little tail on the low end from the DLS uh, parameters that it was seeing. And lastly, the, we have CBD oil number three, 
similar results, everything there. You can see a little bit more of a tail here as well um, with some of the ingredients that were in there, uh, making it different. We basically applied the same uh, sonication to each of the three. So these are a direct comparison of how each of them assembled into that particular sizing value. In this particular case, 110 nanometer um, value for the DLS results and uh, approximately um, slightly lower than that for the uh, modal value with the DLS, or excuse me, with the LS value. So in summary, just want to go and say that um, there are a myriad of applications across life science and industrial markets. Um, emulsion stability is a key quality attribute that uh, will impart a kinetic stability, uh, which is very useful when for a variety of these different applications, both uh, you know transporting to you know manufacturing sites, uh, the ability to have it coat very well on the the the, the, the house that you're painting, uh, and drug delivery, the ability to go through the body uh, and without being um, breaking down and or being captured by uh, uh, the liver or the, the kidney. Um, we used two different, showed two different uh, detection techniques for this, uh, both a, a little bit higher resolution laser diffraction as well as the dynamic light scattering. Um, and the merits of these techniques were discussed in two case studies. Uh, at this point, I will thank you all for your time and attention and open it up for questions and comments. Uh, I'll pass it on to Tracy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Costello, for your informative presentation. We're going to now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So we have a, a lot of questions coming in, very interesting, and we're gonna get started with our first question. So Dr. Costello, our first question is, uh, vaccines are a hot topic at the moment. Are these analysis techniques applicable to vaccine emulsions? Yes, the, yes they are, and they have been. Um, Vaccine emulsions have been around for a, a long time. Um, they've sort of progressed with the, the technology that's available uh, to, to the formulators. Um, a lot of the micron size emulsion technology has been the, the real workhorse. Uh, but uh, we are, and they, they certainly use uh, emulsifiers to stabilize uh, the mixtures. Um, I have seen uh, numerous uh, documents or publications that are starting to go down into the uh, the nanometer size um, properties of some of these vaccines for for delivery of the drugs. So yes, they are Thanks. applicable. Okay. Um, our next question is: In your case studies. I assume you were using the theory sizing algorithms for your size analysis. How did you obtain uh, the refractive index models required for me theory calculations? Okay, yes. Uh, again, um, me theory, um, maybe perhaps a, a, just a quick um, reference to that. Uh, me theory is a stronger algorithm solution um, over what we call Fraunhofer uh, theory. Fraunhofer was developed in the 1800s uh, for laser light diffraction. Uh, it is a rigorous uh, mathematical solution, but it deals with particles that are significantly larger than the wavelength of light. So in general terms, you know, you could use Fraunhofer uh, above um, about 50 micron particle sizes and get uh, use very good results. Um, the this does not require the use of refractive indices. Now, me theory is as we were 
particle size analysis was becoming further hewn uh, to lower and lower particle sizes. Um, me, another mathematician uh, from Germany, uh, developed an algorithm that really a, a theory that uh, basically addresses the uh, optical properties that are affecting the light distribution of the particles, particularly in the size ranges where they're getting close to the wavelength of light. Um, the, the, what's required there is that they have to have a refractive index model of the particle as well as the solution in which they're being dispersed to do the correct solutions. So with me theory, um, it's typical practice to use a refractometer to measure what the uh, the real part of the uh, refractive index is of both the liquid as well as the uh, as the solid particles. Uh, but as well, you can get into the imaginary part, which is the absorption of particles. Uh, depending on the amount of absorption of light that occurs, you can correct for that using the imaginary part. That can be done with a um, a UV vis spectrophotometer looking at the absorbance of light as a function of wavelength. The LS13320 has a complex refractive index modeling capability that allows you to plug in um, both the real and imaginary part as a function of wavelength dependence. Because again, with our PID detection system, we have the three different wavelengths. So to answer the question, uh, we would use those um, refractive index uh, measurement techniques, um, refractometers and UV vis absorbers. What range of reproducibility values did you obtain with the flavor oil emulsion testing? Those triplicate runs were pretty tight. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the one of the nice things about um, the emulsif emulsion technology down in that range, uh, you can get uh, fairly uh, tight distributions uh, and it can be very reproducible. Um, the overlays on those were less than 0.1% CVs. Uh, that's not to say that you get that every time. Uh, one of the things that can test the stability of the emulsion is to do replicate runs and look to see whether or not it's maintaining its um, uh, size distribution over an extended period of time. But uh, to answer the question, uh, those were approximately or, or less than 0.1% CVs, coefficient of variation, variability. Can we use nano emulsions for delivering transcription factors? Can transcription vectors, I would say the answer is perhaps yes. Um, I, as long as uh, the transcript, transcription vectors can be protected uh, and engineered to be appropriate size that allows them to go through appropriate channels, uh, you can use those as delivery tools. Thank you. Um, for the CBD oils, could you again elaborate on what was the difference between the two techniques? Uh, 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 sizing techniques? Um, um, this person uh, says that they can't, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. They couldn't understand which plot to focus on, and their question is really uh, surrounding the dilution identical between the two techniques. They want to know if it's oh. identical. Okay, excellent. I can I can answer that question. Um, once again, uh, I, I I mentioned that we we started uh, we we did the emulsification with the the, the, the high parasonicator of these three different. Um, 
CBD oils. Uh, we then took them over and uh, started to measure each one individually in the laser diffraction system. Uh, and, and what you basically do there is you have a carrier solution of water circulating. Uh, you go through the various startup procedures to do alignment and background checks, and then uh, start to pipette in um, the particles. Uh, the obscuration reading, the amount of particles being added will obscure the beam. You want to hit to a particular size uh, or obscuration value uh, that is going to give you nice statistical uh, accounting, but not do multiple scattering. And so once you have that, you then run it and uh, you can get those sizing results. Those were the sharp peaks that uh, are displayed in the overlay of those. Those were from laser diffraction. What we literally did after that measurement was done is we pipetted out some of that solution directly into a cuvette and measured it with the dynamic light scattering instrument. And so those are the results that uh, sizing results that we got with DLS for the exact same uh, dilution. What range of emulsions do we get by using sonication? Uh, we were able to emulsify the emulsify a five to ten nanometer five to ten micron emulsion uh with some um, you know the less uh surfactants uh using the two hundred watt uh sonicator uh get we got all the way down to in one particular case about sixty na sixty nanometer um size. Uh, the other two uh, went to as low as 110 and 130 nanometers. Um, they basically were uh, a result of five minutes at 200 watts. Each of those three results were done with the exact same uh, process. Thank you, Dr. Costello. Okay, we have time for one more question. So our last question is um, for PIDs. Is there a limit for dispersed phase volume fraction? And um, could you elaborate on the refractive index requirement? Yeah, um, a limit on the dispersed phase fraction. Uh, I can handle that uh, a number of ways. Um, as far the limit on the dispersed phase fraction, I've, from a sizing point of view, um, we can go, we can, we physically measure particles, mean populations down to 10 nanometers. We can go a little bit lower that, than that. It depends on the uh, the level of scattering, because now you're getting to extremely small particle sizes and, um, you know, the amount of scattering that's going on. Uh, so uh, we typically will go with fairly small uh, obscuration values down in that range because we min want to minimize multiple scattering. And so we load up in the case of these kinds of uh, populations, uh, we will load up with any anywhere from the, I, I can only quote on what the, the population is in terms of obscuration values. We typically will go with about 10% to 20% obscuration value uh, with these kinds of emulsion because you start to get uh, lots of, of, of multiple scattering, it'll smear the beam somewhat. 
Um, refractive index modeling, uh, we pretty much attempt to use the, the values that we, we can get from the uh, refractometer and uh, UV vis absorbance. Uh, however, we are continuing to move smaller and smaller and, and, and really testing the optical properties of these particles. And so I think everyone in particle size analysis down in that range regime um, will have to be that much more cognizant of what, how those optical properties of these smallest of particles are going to be changing and affected um, in solution. So that will continue, continue to evolve with solutions. Thank you again, Dr. Costello. Do you have any final comments for our audience today? Um, I just want to thank everyone for um, the excellent questions as well as participating. And I wish them all a very safe and healthy 2020 and future. Thank you. Uh, before we go, I would like to thank again the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions that we did not have time for and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank you, Dr. John Costello, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.